Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ko Usang Ungo. Uh, it's my honor to be here today. Uh, but yeah, I'm a little bit nervous uh, because yeah, this is the first time to present uh, in front of many students and professors in the university class. A month ago, uh, Professor Guyan Kim asked me to give a presentation in this class. I said yes without any thinking. <laughs> a few days later, I, I, I got to realize that uh, I had to speak in English. <laughs> that was the problem. But now I'd like to, uh, my English is not fluent, but uh, I'd like to promise you this today. Uh, I will do my best to let you understand what I'm saying <laughs> during the class. Yeah, I think that's what I can do in this class. Uh, I think uh, many people nowadays know the, about the uh, oil sands because it's becoming an easy oil nowadays. When I first started the uh, research on oil sand, I didn't know anything at all. I didn't even know the, uh, what the oil sand was. One day uh, in 2009, as uh, four years ago, my boss came to me and just ordered me to develop new material for oil sand business. That was all. <laughs> yeah, at that time I thought that uh, to be a boss in Pasco is wonderful. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was my first step to oil sand. Yeah, from then on uh, I started to research on the oil sand. Yeah, in this pre presentation I will uh, cover uh, general information, including introduction, marketing business opportunities, production technologies of oil sand, material challenges happening in oil, in oil sand business. And uh, finally, I will uh, a little bit discuss uh, our recent, recent research activities of POSCO. Oil sand is the uh, mixture of sand, bitumen, clay, and water. Here you can see the oil sand. It's just like the sand. Yeah, nobody knows this is sand, oil sand. Yeah, here you can see the uh, uh, structure of oil sand. There are many sands here covered with water film and the, uh, uh, at the interfaces of sands and there are bitumen. Here is the bitumen. Bitumen is extracted or recovered from oil sands. Yeah, uh, bitumen, you can see here uh, APEC gravity and uh, viscosity. APEC gravity is the uh, uh, inversely proportional to viscosity. It's an easy way, of, easy way to understand APEC gra gravity. Yeah, as for the uh, viscosity, uh, viscosity of bitumen is about 100 times higher than ketchup. Please don't try to put it on the pizza. <laughs> it's too hard to spray it on it. Yeah, after uh, extracting the bitumen, a bitumen is transported to upgrade process. Uh, bitumen is the upgrade to the synthetic crude. Yeah, synthetic crude is uh, pretty similar to conventional crude oil. Now on this page, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about attraction and econo economic feasibility of oil sands. Uh, here, here are the five world top uh, Oil, oil reserves in the world in billion barrels. Uh, it's, it's needless to say the Saudi has the biggest reserves as for uh, for the uh, conventional oil. Yeah, but when you take a look at this total amount, yeah, total amount of the uh, oil sand is almost identical to the uh, amount of conventional oil. Yeah. This is uh, why uh, oil sand the recovery is very important. Many people uh, uh, expect is ex many people are expecting that the uh, conventional oil will be depleted within uh, 40 or 50 years. So this is why we have to develop oil sands. Uh, this figure shows the uh, change in the oil price from 2008 to 2013. Uh, in, in the late in uh, uh, 
2008, the oil price dropped sharply. Uh, everybody knows why this happened. If this is because of the financial crisis of the United States. After that, the uh, oil price is continually, continuously increasing or keep constant over seven dollars. Yeah, to produce the oil sands from uh, oil from oil sand, uh, oil price should be higher than uh, fifty to six dollars. Yeah, many people are uh, is uh, expecting the oil price will be continuous over $80 in the future. So people in oil sand business can make a profit from oil sand. Uh, on this page, I'd like to uh, talk about the conventional ener energy resources. Uh, in this circle diagram, uh, you can see the uh, portion of the en energy resources. Here are uh, the uh, conventional gas. <laughs> Here is the uh, conventional oil. All the other things are unconventional gas. Uh, this figure, uh, you can see the distribution of the oil, res oil and gas resources. Here is the uh, conventional gas, and here is the uh, conventional oil. Here is the cobalt methane, oil shale, and uh, shale gas, and here is tight gas and gas. Uh, for uh, understanding, uh, I uh, converted to all the energy sources into oil on the basis of the uh, heat generation capacity uh, in terms of trillion barrel. When you take a look at this, uh, uh, here is conventional oil and gas. The reserves are much higher in case of the unconventional. This is why we have to focus on unconventional energy right now. I think this is very important. Uh, sorry. There are two main oil sand reserves in the world. One is Canada, the other is Venezuela. Yeah, Alberta, Alberta Canada uh, produced 2.4 million barrels of oil per day in 2012. In, in Korea, we consumed about 2.1 million barrels for oil per day in 2011. It's, uh, the, the amount of the uh, oil produced from oil sand in Alberta in 2012 is uh, more than we consumed in 2011. Yeah, it's pretty much. Uh, they are uh, now planning to produce four, uh, 8 million barrels of oil in 2018. Uh, Venezuela has the world's largest, largest uh, oil sand reserves, but uh, they have a limited, limited production due to the uh, technical problems and the polit political issues like Chavez. Uh, this page shows the uh, oil sand distribution in Alberta, Canada. Oil sand in Canada is located, uh, localized in uh, Alberta in Port McMurray. Uh, here uh, you can see the Calgary, here Edmonton. Yeah, made three major uh, oil sand deficit in Alberta is located surrounding the Fort McMurray. Fort McMurray is uh, about 300 kilometers from uh, Edmonton, 600 kilometers from Calgary. In Calgary, we, we, can, ha we can see many uh, headquarters of the oil sand <coughs> companies and the uh, uh, engineering, engineering, engineering companies in Edmonton. There are, there are many uh, refineries and operators. Yeah, in Fort, Man, Fort McMurray, uh, there is mine and there are lots of oil sands. When you have a chance to visit Fort McMurray, you can, uh, you can feel the smell of oil, even in the airport. Yeah, here is, uh, this is the uh, Suncor base plant in Fort McMurray. Yeah, it is, uh, there are many pipelines here. It's just like the uh, chemical company. Uh, now I'd like to uh, show you one video clip uh, to show the, uh, how oil sand companies produce oil from oil sands. Please enjoy this video. I, they, what they are speaking in English is better than mine. <laughs> huh? 
How big is it? Okay, you've probably heard of the oil sand, right? That's because there's oil in the sand. Yeah, ooey gooey thick oil called bitumen. Okay, you've probably heard of the oil sands, right? That's because there's oil in the sand. Yeah, ooey gooey thick oil called bitumen. So, how did the oil get there in the first place? Yeah, and how do we get it out? It all started about 110 million years ago. Dinosaurs ruled the earth and Alberta was covered by a warm, shallow ocean. Billions of tiny creatures in the How did the oil get there in the first place? Yeah, and how do we get it out? It all started about 110 million years ago. Dinosaurs ruled the earth and Alberta was covered by a warm, shallow ocean. Billions of tiny creatures in the Okay, you've probably heard of the oil sands, right? That's because there's oil in the sand. Yeah, ooey gooey thick oil called bitumen. So, how did the oil get there in the first place? Yeah, and how do we get it out? It all started about 110 million years ago. Dinosaurs ruled the earth and Alberta was covered by a warm, shallow ocean. Billions of tiny creatures in the water died and piled up on the sandy ocean floor. Eventually, they morphed to become bitumen. Well, let's flash forward to now. The dinos are long gone and the ocean is dried up. All that bitumen is mixed up in the sand, which is in deposits close to the Earth's surface and we want it. But first, we have to separate it from the sand. At Suncor's mine, big shovels dig up the oil sands. How, How big, big is, is it? it? The bucket is six meters wide and five meters tall, which is the size of a two-car garage. And the entire machine weighs 1,500 tons, which is more than 300 hippos. The mine trucks are pretty big too. How big, How big is, is it? it? Suncor's cat, 797B trucks are 380 tons, one of the world's biggest. It's like trying to drive a two-story house. Wow. When fully loaded, the truck weighs 625 tons, more than a jumbo jet. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. We are currently at our cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. Let's get back to separating bitumen from the sand. Okay. The trucks dump the oil sand into hoppers for crushing. Conveyor belts move the sand to rotary drums. And here's where the magic starts to happen. The secret to separating bitumen from sand is... Hot water! Inside the drums, hot water is mixed with the sand and virtually melts the thick bitumen 
so it separates from the set. This process is called extraction. Suncor has big water tanks to supply the hot water needed for extraction. How big is it? One of the tanks holds 30 million liters, enough for 250,000 hot showers. Two things are left over after the extraction. One is a mix of sand and water called tailings, which gets pumped out to Suncor's tailings pond. More about tailings ponds in a minute. And the other is bitumen, which is now ready for processing into useful things like fuel. The bitumen gets broken into different compounds in big vessels called cokers. How, How big, big is it? 88 meters tall, 10 meters wide, weighs 440,000 kilograms, or 440 tons, or the equivalent of about 88 Tyrannosaurus Rex. From the cokers, these new products go to a bunch of other vessels for more processing. This part of the oil sand story is called... Upgrading! Upgrading creates fuel like diesel and jet fuel, plus many other products that we use every day, and of course, crude oil that can be further refined to make gasoline. Back to those tailings ponds. Suncor has some really good news. Suncor is starting to use a new process that takes water out of the tailings more quickly than ever before. Eventually, this should mean no more tailings ponds, and that's good news for the environment. So, uh, is that all? Not quite. There's another way Suncor gets bitumen out of oil sand. In some places, oil sand is buried too far underground to be mined with those big shovels and trucks. So, Suncor uses a different method to get the bitumen up to the ground surface. And it's called... SEG-D! Which stands for Seam Assisted Gravity Drainage. By the way, SEG-D is way less land than mining with shovels and trucks. And if you guess that involves more hot water, you're right. Yeah, it's really hot water. Steam, actually. Steam gets injected underground into the oil sand. It melts the bitumen just enough so it lets go of the sand grain and starts flowing to other pipes that suck it up and bring it to the surface. And when the bitumen gets up here, it's piped back to Suncor's oil sand plant for... Upgrading! There's just one more thing. Getting oil out of oil sand uses electricity, natural gas, water, and land, and creates air emissions. Some like carbon dioxide, contribute to climate change. Suncor knows that getting oil from oil sand does affect the environment, and they are working hard to reduce these effects. Suncor is taking less water from the Athabasca River, recycling the water they do take, reducing air emissions per barrel of oil they produce, and reclaiming mined out land. That means putting the soil back and planting lots of trees some years, Suncor plants more than half a million trees. Suncor is serious about caring for the environment. They have a lot of smart people working on it. So you can see that just because Suncor is a big company that uses a lot of big stuff, when it comes to the environment, they're trying to make their impact small. And that is the big and small of it all. This video. <laughs> it, it, it's something like adver advertisement of Suncor, but it's very, I think, uh, informative. Uh, yeah, as, as you, see, you have seen uh, in, the, in this video, uh, I will talk a little bit detail of the process and the materials and all sand. Oh, this is the uh, summary of ores and business, ores and production technology. Uh, there are two main types of uh, production in ore sand business. One is the mining process, and the other is in situ. When the reservoir depth is over uh, 75 meters, yeah, they usually uh, apply uh, in, situ, in situ technology. Otherwise, yeah, they, they use the uh, mining production technology. 
Uh, first, I'll talk about the mine, mining process. Uh, in mining process, the uh, uh, shovels are uh, excavate the uh, oil sand and the, uh, put it on the truck and how truck transport the oil sand to the crusher. In the crusher, ores and rocks are cru crushed into small pieces and uh, it is stored in the surge bin, like silo. And uh, after that, the uh, oil sand, small pot particles uh, mixed with warm water and caustic soda to make slurry. And then slurry is tra transported to the uh, primar primary separation vessel to make bitumen. Yeah, here is a slurry pipes, which is called uh, hydro transport pipes. And then in the primary separate PSP, which is called the uh, primary primary separate vessel. Yeah, here uh, they have the uh, bitumen from all sands, and the, the other residues like uh, uh, sands, rocks, and water are transported to the tailing ponds. Yeah, the pipe used for the uh, this process is called the tailing pipes. These two these two pipe systems are called slurry pipe systems. Yeah, after our primary separation, the uh, bitumen is further uh, recovered in the frost plant, and then uh, recovered bitumen is transported to the upgrader. Yeah, upgrader makes the uh, synthetic crude like uh, conventional crude oil. After this process, the process is uh, pretty similar to the uh, conventional oil production system. Uh, in case of the uh, in situ process, uh, there is no upstream process like a mining process. They just put the pipes under the ground to the reservoir and they put the steam inside and melt to melt the bitumen from the oil sands and they directly produce bitumen from the bottom and then the bitumen produced from bottom to the surface will be uh, transported to the operator. That's it. <laughs> This is two. <laughs> this is two types of the uh, oil sand production technologies. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask me something. <laughs> yeah. If you have any questions, please start me talking and uh, let's dis discuss it. Uh, from this page here, over uh, three or three or four pages, coming pages, I will talk. A little, a little deep details about the uh, mining process and material challenges happening in the business. Uh, here you can see the shovels. <laughs> this is shovel. Uh, th this is shovel tis. The bucket is pretty big. Yeah, there is a wear problem in shovel tis. Shovel tis, and this is the hollow truck, which can transport uh, six six hundred tons of sand to the uh, crusher. Yeah, here you can see the tire. The size of tire is two times bigger than the uh, person standing here. Yeah, the price of the I heard that the price of this this tire is uh, about the uh, forty thousand dollars per inch. It's very expensive. There is a hollow truck. Uh, at the bottom of hollow truck, there is a wear problem. This is a crusher in the uh, sink room. Uh, in the crusher, uh, oil sand rocks and the uh, uh, rocks are crushed into the two to five inches in diameter, depending on the, the screen size. Uh, materials used in this area is the cast iron, high carbon steel, and chrome carbide or the tungsten carbide overlays to prevent wear. Yeah, even though they are using this kind of, these kind of materials, there are big problems of wear. Wear of shovel teeth and truck bed and wear of crusher teeth. Yeah, this is the problem. Uh, this is the uh, slurry plant called the cyclopeter and sink root. Yeah, in cyclopeter, uh, oil sands are mixed with water, warm water and caustic soda to make slurry for transportation and separation. Uh, to make a bitumen from uh, oil sand, we have to use water to separate uh, oils from sand. 
Yeah, these celeries are uh, transported to the primary separate vessel here through a, a hydrogen transport pipe. The hydrogen transport pipes are about the one, 10 kilometers long. Yeah, it's pretty long. And the, uh, in the primary vessel, yeah, it, it, this is schematics of the uh, primary separate vessel. Here is the uh, bitumen froth. Here is middlings and sand and ore. Uh, Stand on the rocks at the bottom. Yeah, middlings are uh, a mixture of uh, fine particles of sand, bitumen, and water. And middlings, middlings are uh, further upgraded in the later. And the, uh, after uh, primary separation, sands and rocks are in the water are transported to tailing pond here through the tailing pipes. The length of telling pipe is pretty long, like about 10 kilometers. Yeah, yeah. Primus transfer vessel is uh, normally located the, away from the uh, telling ponds. Yeah, here you can see the three telling pipes in the Suncor site. Yeah, slurry pipes are, the, uh, there are two types of slurry pipes as I told you before in previous pages. There are hydro transport pipe <coughs> to transport slurry to the primary separate vessel and tailing pipes to transport tailings like uh, sands and water to tailing ponds. They are called slurry pipes. Yeah, the operating environment of the uh, slurry pipes are here. Yeah, all sand slurry are composed of bitumen sand, 58% of sand, and water and chloride. Yeah, the temperature is uh, around 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. Yeah, it depends on the operating environment of the each company. Yeah, slurry velocity from 3.5 to 6 meters per second. Yeah, material they are using nowadays is the APX65 B grade and 70 grade for strict line. Major part of the slurry pipe is uh, APX65 or X70. Sometimes they use current carbon double A for bands because there are big uh, problem of wear at bands. Yeah, here the uh, because of the wear of slurry pipes, as you can see here, uh, this is original thickness of pipes. Here is the uh, this is used one. It collapsed because of the loss of thickness. Because of this problem, uh, here you can see the uh, eroding corrosion. Yeah, here is the tailing sand. You can see here sand. And because of this kind of wear problem, they have to periodically, uh, periodically uh, rotate pipes. One to three times, sometimes four times a year, they rotate pipes. And the, uh, while they are rotating the pipe, they have to shut down their facility. This leads to the uh, loss of the revenue of our sand company. And sometimes, uh, once a year, average, uh, in average, uh, they uh, replace the whole pipe, pipe system with new one. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, a big problem of our sand company. So we uh, decided to uh, develop a new material for this. Yeah, uh, we estimated the total cons consumption of solid pipes of oil sand company in Alberta, Canada. Yeah, the consumption of uh, solid pipe material is about the 130,000 tons in two two this year, and it will be over uh, 300 tons in 2018. Yeah, it, it's a pretty big business to us. Ah, uh, this is the schematics of Synchrotron North Mine in Fort McMurray. When I first started the uh, oil sand development, oil sand research, I didn't know, I didn't know at all. Though, so I, I really wanted to make this diagram, but nobody taught me this kind of things. When I met uh, people from the uh, oil sand companies, then they didn't tell me anything. 
Yeah, I, to make this diagram, I met many, many people. Yeah, one people taught me this, one people taught me this, and I uh, com combined all together and make this diagram. Uh, here, uh, in my side of the think route in Fort McMurray, they have about uh, 400, over 400 shovels and trucks. And they have two crushers, and they have two cycle feeders. And here is the hydro transport pipes to transport the uh, slurries from cycle feeder to the uh, primary separate passer. Yeah, yeah, transport, hydro transport pipes are 10 kilometers long in North Mine. And they have two pipes. And yeah, they have uh, four units, uh, four uh, primary separate passers and frost plant and upgrade in North Mine. And the up in the tailing pipe, this is tailing pipes. They have uh, one, two, three, five, six, six tailing pipes of 10 kilometers long. Yeah. They have to change all these pipes every year. Yeah. This, this, this is just the summary of the uh, North Mine. Uh, here is the uh, requirement and the, uh, of the slurry pipes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've already told you in the previous page. Currently still used are uh, API X65 and 70. They are a uh, normal case in the ero erosion and corrosion is the main problem here. They have to rotate pipes one to three times, sometimes four times, five times a year. They have to replace pipes once a year, once a year on average. Uh, here is the uh, requirement. Strength requirement is over APX. 42 grade, uh, they need the uh, insurance of the uh, toughness of base metal and weld metal at the uh, minus 40 to minus and minus 90, 29 degrees Celsius. Yeah, this is a mandatory uh, requirement of the uh, material used in the oil sand business. And uh, this is the, uh, our target. We wanted to increase the uh, erosion corrosion resistance, which will lead to the uh, increase in the lifetime of pipes. Yeah, we, with this we can appeal uh, to we can appeal our product to our uh, customers. Uh, here is a uh, research history of uh, POSCO on oil sand, oil sand materials. In 2009, yeah, as I told you before, uh, my boss ordered to develop new material. So our director went to the uh, Alberta. I stayed there uh, for two months. When I uh, arrived at the uh, uh, Edmonton in, in, on September in 2009, the temperature was uh, about 35 degrees Celsius. So <laughs> there happened something amazing. Within a week, the temperature went down to minus uh, 10 to 20. It was shocking to me. <laughs> and then uh, when I uh, went to the Fort McMurray in March last year, yeah, I, I, I felt happy because it's a spring season. But when I got there, uh, the temperature was minus 40. Yeah, it's, it's pretty shocking to me. Uh, it was, yeah, after uh, survey and market and technology, uh, we started the uh, feasibility test for development of new carbon steel for oil sands to lead pipes for two years, and we developed new material, carbon steel material, material last year. And uh, we are gonna planning to, uh, we are gonna uh, put the test pipes in the Suncor site uh, in, in about uh, two months this year. Uh, if the performance is good in on site, uh, we will produce commercially and in, in the, uh, we will sell the uh, material, new material. Uh, here are the uh, many companies and the uh, research, research institutes we are working with. Here is POSCO, Suncor is all sand majors, Think Crude, CNRL, also Imperial Oil. And Shell Canada is the all sand majors here. And we are working with Dell International, which is the family company of POSCO. And we are uh, collaborating to develop the new material with the uh, uh, research institute in Canada like University of Alberta, Alberta Innovate Technology Futures, Saskatchewan Research in Saskatoon. 
Uh, when we decided to the uh, new material for slurry pipes, there was a big challenge. It was trade up properties, properties of steel. Uh, uh, slurry pipes has the uh, material for the uh, uh, slurry pipes has the uh, flammability, has to have a uh, flammability, toughness, strength, and erosion resistance as well. But uh, this is general knowledge, the common knowledge that if the hardness is high, the erosion resistance is high. This is, this is common knowledge, I think. But the, uh, if the uh, hardness, we increase, we increase the hardness of material, we cannot make it into pipe because the, we can, because strength is too high, so it's, it's hard to form, to form into pipe. So it was a problem. Yeah, this two graph shows yeah, the relationship between uh, strength, hardness, and the wear resistance. Here you can see that if we increase the uh, 1.8 times of tensile strength, we can double the, the uh, double the hardness of material. Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, wear test do you do? Yeah, I will talk about it later in this presentation. Yeah. Yeah. If you uh, Increase the hardness two times. Uh, this is two times. My mistake. Yeah. If you increase the hardness two times, you can just increase the uh, uh, about the open six times of wear resistance. Yeah. Uh, in this case, uh, if, if with this uh, we can say that uh, if we double double the hardness, we can increase the one point six times of erosion resistance, but we cannot form this material into pipe because strength is too high. Yeah, this is problem. <coughs> yeah, this is a very famous diagram showing the relationship between hardness and relative erosion resistance of material. As you can see here, uh, Martin site has the best erosion resistance because the hardness is pretty high. Uh, but the, uh, the problem is that uh, we cannot make martensite into pipe. Yeah. In, the, uh, in this uh, picture, uh, relative hardness of material to abras abrasive like sand affects the uh, erosion resistance. Uh, the, uh, the relative hardness of APX65, which is now used for uh, solid pipes, are here. Uh, if you increase the uh, hardness to high amount martens martensite value, like bearing steels, you can increase three times erosion resistance. But this, this cannot be applied to the pipes because you cannot form pipes with the high carbon martensite steels. Uh, in, case of, in case of a low carbon mar martensite, the perform performance is not pretty good compared to the Apex X65. Uh, when we started the development of a new material for solid pipes, I cannot, I could not find any way to make it. So I uh, thought and thought and thought, even in my dream. So uh, after that, uh, after all, I decided to use hard particles, particles like cementite. Yeah, here you can see the uh, hardness of cementite is pretty similar to silicon dioxide, which is the main composition of the uh, Sense. Uh, well, after I decided to use the uh, cementite, I uh, I've been thinking of uh, how to use the cementite effectively. Yeah, there are three chances of the cementite for forms. One is for cementite. The second is the ferrite to cement particles like bainite. And the uh, third one is the lamin laminar polite. Uh, in, uh, in case of the uh, full cementite, it's brittle. It's useless. And it, we cannot form with cementite plate. We cannot form pipes. So this, is, this, is, this was not possible. And the uh, particle cementite, in case of particle cementite, uh, uh, sand particles, when the sand particles particle impacts the uh, surface of steel, uh, steel matrix will, will be fall out. 
with the uh, particle sanitized if the size is small. But the, uh, in the case of lamellar uh, polite, brittle cementites are protected by uh, soft matrix, and soft matrix is uh, protected by the hard cementite from cutting or flowing. With this background, we uh, tested commercially used steels with the uh, AP thrice and rubber fill test. This is called the ASTM G65 test, test method. Here is the prisoner hardness. This is weight loss in, uh, te in the test. As you can see here, uh, here is the uh, APX65. Here is a low carbon martin site. Here is ferrite polite steel. Yeah, after this test, I, I got to know that the ferrite polite microstructure can have the higher wear resistance than the uh, low carbon, low carbon martin site. Uh, this is the effect of the carbon shape. Uh, carbon shape. Now, uh, this is a lamellar perlite steel, ferrite polite steel. And with same steel, we heat treated to spiral the cementite into globular form. After testing, we, uh, uh, after this, we uh, tested these samples with the uh, STM665 test method. As you can see, your level resistance is uh, higher in, in the uh, lamella structure of polite. Yeah. Uh, so in the, after uh, this test, this all kind of tests, we decided to use the uh, lamellar polite and uh, fer soft ferrite. But the, when we I first produced the material with a ferrite polite mark structure, the problem was the impact toughness. Yeah, impact toughness was below 10 joules, even at room temperature. That was a big problem to me. Even, even though the uh, erosion resistance is high, if, if, if the impact toughness is pretty low, we cannot uh, make it and then uh, make five to for the oil, oil sand industry because temperature in Fort Memory is around 40 to 50, minus 40 to 50, minus 50 in the winter season. So we have to ensure the low temperature tough, toughness. So we uh, solved this problem over uh, three months or five months. Uh, we refined grains to increase toughness. Uh, we optimized the chemical composition to lower the transformation temperature. And we reduced the austenite grain size. And we put the heavy deformation uh, during the uh, hot rolling at the low temperature. Afterwards, uh, we got the properties like this. Uh, the toughness of steel plate produced in the commercial mill is always over 50 joules and minus 40 degrees Celsius. Oh, this is the uh, uh, testing system. Uh, in previous pa on pa pre previous pages, we uh, used the dry sand rubble test uh, just to take a look at how it worked in a uh, wear condition. But it's not the same in the condition uh, at the uh, Suncor site because, because they used mixture of water and sand and chloride. So we uh, s developed a new system. It, this is called slurry pot wear corrosion assessment system. Uh, we made it to be evaluated wear and corrosion performance of steel in simulated operating environment. With this thing, we can control many uh, variables like a solid composition, temperature, dissolved oxygen level, solid velocity, impact angle as well. Uh, and this is a schematic illustration of this system. We put the samples at the bottom. At, at the bottom, and the, this state is rotating at, at a speed of maximum 6.5 meters per second. And here is slurry. Uh, when we first uh, developed this system, we uh, just put the bare sample at the bottom. But there was a problem. Uh, the wearer was localized at the corner edge of specimen. 
the result was not consistent. So we uh, changed the sample design. We made a, a holder for the sample to prevent the uh, concentration of wear at the edge or at the corner. The, after that, we can have the we could have the uh, consistent result. Uh, here is the uh, effect of uh, in operating environment in all sense to large pipes. Uh, this is uh, the effect of time of testing on weight loss in slurry testing. Yeah, it, it, this, yeah, after two hours here, uh, the uh, increase, increasing rate is lower the, because the uh, sand particles, particles uh, were damaged during the test. So we decided to use the two, two hours of testing time. And yeah, this is the effect of oxygen level. When the oxygen level is high, as the oxygen le level goes high, the uh, weight loss increases. But uh, if you take a look at this, the, uh, when the slurry velocity is very high, the effect of oxygen in the uh, slurry do not have uh, much effect on the uh, weight loss. Yeah, in this case, when the slurry velocity is pretty high, the main reason for the loss is where uh, this is the uh, effect of velocity on weight loss in slurry test here you can see uh, when the oxygen level is pretty low the uh, dependence of slurry velocity is pretty high yeah. here the major problem is the, the wear oh. This page shows the uh, uh, erosion corrosion resistance of ferrite polite materials we are uh, we have produced during development processes. Uh, this is the effect of hardness on weight loss. Yeah, here you can see the as the hardness increases, the wear rate decreases sharply and then keep constant or decreases. From this diagram, we we determined that the uh, optimum hardness because the uh, we increases hardness, strengths will be increased, uh, and toughness will be decreased. This is problem of pipe, pipe making. And this, if strength is too high, we cannot form it into pipe. If toughness is low, we cannot apply it to the Canada. So that's why we uh, optimize the uh, hardness value. <coughs> uh, uh, by optimizing the uh, volume fraction of ferrite and polite, we uh, had a optimum value of erosion corrosion resistance here. Uh, this here is the reason I think this is a, just what I think. Uh, if the uh, hardness is uh, pretty low and uh, or a high fraction of ferrite are are there, decreasing wear resistance due to the lack of hard faces. If the uh, uh, material is very soft, uh, very very uh, hard, or the, uh, there are many of polite, the uh, there will be a decrease in the uh, wear resistance due to lack of surf surface defam deformation capacity. Yeah, you know the uh, polite is uh, very brittle because the uh, impact uh, if the uh, solid particles impact on surface, it will. Uh, be broken and the fall out from surface. Yeah, this is the uh, uh, pipes we made in the uh, plate mill, uh, uh, pipe mills in Korea. We produce the uh, new material in the uh, uh, commercial mills and uh, send them to the pipe mills and we made pipes into pipes. Yeah, it was successful. Yeah, here is a summary of uh, uh, our product. The product, yeah, the size is so quarter, three quarter inches in thickness, 24 to 32 inches in outer diameter, and the length is 12 meters. Uh, here is the erosion corrosion resistance and yield strength impact properties of has and base metal. Here is the estimate price. <laughs> uh, when the uh, the performance of the uh, Wear and corrosion resistance is here uh, 
when the uh, oxygen level is low and fluid velocity is six meters per second, uh, the, per, the resistance is one point of around 1.5 times of API 65. Uh, and the, uh, when the oxygen level is low and fluid velocity is pretty low, the uh, performance is over two, two times. However, the, uh, there are lots of oxygen in the uh, slurry. The performance is pretty similar to APEX 6 part. So we can say we cannot apply this. We can apply this to slurry system, pipe system, but there is no big difference when the ox oxygen is pretty high. Yeah, wow. we had a mm, reasonable yield trend because we already formed them into pipes. Yeah, it's, and the uh, impact property is good. And 69 joules, 60 joules. Uh, this is a test at minus 20, 29 degrees Celsius. Yeah, estimate price is uh, around 150% wave 65. But actually, uh, the production cost is 10% lower than APX 65 so far. Oh. There is no mechanical yeah, it was tested at uh, minus 29 degrees Celsius as for, uh, for the has. So the, there is a temperature difference here from uh, between the uh, base metal and the head metal. Uh, and the, uh, yeah, that's the main reason I think. Uh, after uh, we produce the plate, new plate, and uh, from uh, our commercial mill, and make, we send them to uh, the uh, Saskatchewan Sas Research to have them test in the flow loop testing. Flow loop is uh, pretty similar to real pipe system. They are simulating the real environment, and the, uh, this is Saskatchewan Research is located in Saskatoon, Canada. Uh, we are. This is cross sections of uh, pipes. We uh, measure the weight loss at the uh, two, two different uh, positions, like a 12 o'clock position and a 4 o'clock position. Yeah, this is the result of the uh, 4 o'clock position in 12 o'clock position. Uh, the uh, wear resistance is uh, about 1.5 times to 2 times better than APS 70. This is a uh, uh, this K55 is a high carbon pyrite pyrrolite steel. The carbon content is about the uh, 0.36 to 0.4. Yeah, it's a new steel is better than uh, even the uh, API K55. Uh, in two o'clock position, the performance is more than two times. Yeah, uh, I uh, bring this material to Suncor early this year, and they said, you last test the pipe in our site. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, from now, uh, I will briefly introduce the in-situ process and material challenges happening there. Uh, there are two major uh, in-situ processes in our science industry. One is cyclic steam stimulation, and the other is the uh, Steam assist gravity drainage. This was shown in the uh, video. Yeah, uh, in uh, different from the mine process, uh, and in in situ process, the uh, the wells are drilled to the reservoir at the bottom. Yeah, they directly uh, gather the bitumen from the bottom to the surface. In CSS process, single well is drilled to the reservoir. And the uh, high temperature pressure steam is injected to the reservoir to melt bitumen from sticky oil sand for several, uh, for several days to, to several months. After that, the, uh, the same well is converted to the uh, production mode, uh, bringing the bitumen to the surface. Yeah. Here, uh, here is high steam to oil ratio. It's uh, around three to six. This means that the, uh, to, uh, in, order, in order to produce uh, one liter of oil, 
they have to use the six liters of water. Yeah, this is a big environmental problem. Uh, here is a steam assisted scrub drainage, which is called SACD. Uh, more than 90% of institute production is uh, carried out with this technology nowadays because it, with this technology, they can produce conti oil continuously. Yeah, in this case, CSS, they, are, they have to change mode from the uh, injection mode to production mode. Yeah, this is the problem. Yeah, in this system, they have a more uh, pro productivity compared to the CSS. So, parallel to horizontal, walls are drilled to the bottom. Yeah, top, top well, uh, steam are injected. Steam is injected to through top well to melt bitumen here, and melt the bitumen goes down to the production well and they are uh, produce a uh, bitumen directly from reservoir to the surface. Now, even in this case, the steam to oil ratio is a uh, two to four. four. Yeah, this is, big, this is pretty big problem. Uh, there are some mature problem here. Uh, one is the high temperature strength of material because they are using high pressure, hot steam. The temperature of steam is around 300 to 40, uh, 400 degrees Celsius. So if we, if we can meet their requirement in the room temperature, if the strength is lower than in high temperature, we cannot uh, ensure the uh, requirement. We cannot meet the uh, requirement of this test. Uh, so I do like to emphasize this. More than 80% of oil sand reserves are too deep to recover using mining process. Yeah, in two, two thousand uh, last year, uh, even though the uh, mine to second ratio is 1.2, the oil produced by uh, by a mine process is is more than that in a uh, second process. Even though this fact, because more than 80% of oil sand are reserved too deep, so. Uh, we can expect greater extent of a second production in the future. It, it will be coming soon, I think. So we decided to our uh, uh, development strategy to second. Uh, there are major, uh, mainly two types of pipe materials for second. One is steam injection and production pipes, and the other is steam transportation pipes. Uh, in steam injection and production pipes, they are using the APEC K55 to L80 pipes, stainless soil ERW pipes. Yeah, they are using the small diameter pipes, about the, uh, 10 centimeters to 20, 20 centimeters in diameter, and thickness is pretty, uh, it's not too thick. Yeah, in the uh, steam transportation pipe, yeah, heat resistance steels are required because the, uh, it has to transport the steam from heat generator to the well. So we are now uh, focusing on the second steam transport pipes. Here is again the uh, steel for second steam pipes. Uh, in this figure, uh, here is the heat generator and the, they are uh, transporting hot steam to the wall pad through the uh, steam pipes. This is about 10 kilometers. Yeah, here is the uh, central process facility. Here they have produced hot steam, high pressure steam, and the, here is the wall pad. Uh, some wall pads are very close to the uh, CF, CPF, but some wells are far away from the central process facility. Yeah, we are. Uh, this year we estimated the <coughs> quantity, the uh, quantity of the uh, pipes. Yeah, in 2000, then 2018, we are expecting they are consuming uh, more than 10,000 tons of steam transportation pipe per year, uh, more than 400 
tons of steam injection approach pipes. Oh, yeah, here is the requirement to select steam pipes. Uh, the mature grade 5, 550, is, it, this is at identical to APX80. Yeah, we have to ensure uh, the high temperature strength over uh, 300 degrees Celsius. Yeah, for feasibility test, we started the test with our currently produced APX80. Yeah, as you can see here, the performance is not that <laughs> good. This is why we have to develop new one. Yeah, we will develop it uh, in the near future, I think. Yeah, this is the last page slide of my presentation. Oh, this is the Lake Louis in Banff. I took this picture in uh, 2009 while I was staying in the Edmonton. I visited Calgary and uh, Canada and Lucky to see where Lake Louis. Yeah, this is very beautiful. Uh, I don't. I, I. I don't like to just summarize what I said at the first page. I. I'd like to emphasize two things here. We have to focus on. We have to move on to the uh, unconventional energy resources. We have to prepare for our future. And the uh, the other thing is here. We can have more chance to make a profit in the energy business only when we know more about the material problem they have on site. Material specialist. Our old sand company has much material specialist, but they are uh, they have no ideas on material development. What they are just doing is just to select best material in the market. That's all. Yeah, our mission is I think uh, to know more about the uh, our customers and energy businesses problems happening there and we have to make the new material and we have to uh, appeal to our customers to use it yeah I think that's our mission as a material scientist yeah that's all I, I prepared thanks for a uh, kind of attention <laughs>